Well, welcome to another Friday night. I want to, in our understanding of trauma, I want to go back to research that is being discovered around our brain and specifically the subconscious brain. So we've done a number of talks on the brain. We've actually covered some stuff on the subconscious brain. But today I want to really come at some new areas that we haven't talked about before in understanding how our subconscious brain works. It's amazing power. But also the fact that our subconscious brain is very prone to biases, prejudices, assumptions, and because of complex trauma, all of those can be negative. All of those can have harmful effects. All of those can be distorted. And so they can do a tremendous amount of damage and we're not even aware of it. And so to me, it's such an important thing in understanding trauma to really begin to appreciate how trauma affects the subconscious brain. And it is huge. It is stuff that we're still learning about. And the more we learn, the more we realize this really has a profound effect on how people develop, how people go about relationships and about life and how they cope and how they think, what they believe, on and on. So let me just give you a test to help you understand first kind of what we're talking about when we talk about the subconscious brain operates off of a whole bunch of assumptions, biases, belief system that might be healthy, it might not be. And if it's not healthy, it can really do a lot of damage. So let me just give you two examples. Let's say somebody you know says, hey, I just know this guy and he just went out and bought a $5 million home. And this guy is, he's one of these rags to riches story. He grew up in a, a very difficult environment where they didn't have very much money, quite poor, and he's made it and he's just got a $5 million home. Now, that's the facts. What goes on inside of your brain? So I want you to think about this in, in two perspectives. So let's say you find out that this friend is white. Your brain might then automatically go, see, that's the result of good, hard work. He got rewarded for that, good for him. Or in our culture today, you might go, hmm, I wonder if he's uh, corrupt. I wonder if that's all of a sudden how he got so rich. He's involved in something that's criminal. Or some might go, hey, he must be a really good spiritual person and God's just blessed him. So what I want you to see from that is our brain automatically jump to certain conclusions, assume certain things. That's the subconscious brain. But let me take that further. Let me say, okay, let's say the person you find out wasn't white, but you find out that they were Russian or African-American, or an indigenous person. What then would your brain go when you find out they just got a $5 million house? You might find it go in a different direction. You might find you go, I bet you that's through corruption. I bet you they're involved in some illegal crime. Very interesting. We made different conclusions based on the ethnicity of the person. So that's the subconscious brain at work. The next one, a homeless person. You see somebody homeless on the street with their shopping cart and all of their stuff. What goes on in your mind? So let me again break this into ethnicity. Let's see, you see a white person who's homeless. You might go, wow, they must have just hit some really hard times. Or bet you they're an addict, or you might go, hmm, bet you they're just lazy, self-disciplined, not self-disciplined, they're self-indulgent, they're morally inferior. That might be your conclusions. What happens if that person was an African-American person or an indigenous person? You might go, lazy, bet you they're inferior morally, not disciplined at all, don't know how to work, you might go to a much harsher conclusion. 
That's all the biases that are within the subconscious brain that often we're not even aware of. They just are happening all the time. So what I want to do is kind of dig into how does that develop? Where does that come from? Because that can do tremendous amount of damage. It can hurt a whole bunch of people. It can lead to all kinds of wrong conclusions. But it happens without us even being aware that it's happening. So let me go back to some of the stuff we've covered before just about the subconscious brain to help you again understand it. And so I'm going to draw on Dr. Bruce Lipton's work right at the beginning here and, and what he's helped us understand. So it's really an understand. One way of looking at the brain is there's, there's two parts. There's the conscious level and the subconscious level. So there's stuff that we do when we consciously think about it, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening that we're not even thinking about. The subconscious brain processes about 40 million bits of data a second. That is mind-boggling to me. The conscious brain, it processes 40 bits of data a second, a million times slower than the subconscious brain. So the subconscious brain is just processing tons of data. So if you think of all the main systems of your body, so you're getting information constantly from your five senses. So about 10 million bits of data are coming through your optic nerve every second. And your subconscious brain is processing that as you walk, as you drive, as you sit. You're just constantly looking at stuff, seeing stuff in your brain is processing that. Then it's getting through your taste, your, your smell, your hearing, what you touch. All of those things, tons of different data. Then... There's indicators that are processing, is it hot, is it cold, do I have an itch, do I need to scratch, do I have a blister forming, do I have a bug on, on one of the hairs of my arm. Every little hair is sending signals, every little skin cell is sending signals, your internal digestive system is sending signals. All of that is being processed by your subconscious brain. Then beyond that, am I thirsty, am I hungry? Am I feeling nauseous? When you climb stairs, all of a sudden something is telling you you need to increase your breathing. Your heart needs to beat faster. You need to sweat to cool down. Then you have, I need to go to the bathroom. Then you have, what happens if a virus or bacteria enters your body? All of a sudden there's part of your brain, the subconscious, that is saying we need to send T-cells. We need to send different ways of fighting this. So that's your subconscious brain. Then when you look at balance, digestion, walking, every internal organ, all of them are operating because your subconscious brain is managing that. So 40 million bits of data a second are happening. So that's the first function of your subconscious brain. The second, and it's the part that I really want us to think about, is your subconscious brain is constantly recording what you're learning about life. And so we call this your default brain network. So it is taking every experience a baby has, an infant has, it's comparing it to other experiences, it's making sense out of life, it is putting pieces together to know what to expect, what is normal, all of that is happening in your subconscious brain. It's creating thousands of programs about life. It is creating thousands of programs about the proper way to react if this happens, the proper things to do in order to deal with this problem. So it's gaining tools. It is all of that. It is learning. It is, it is putting together a picture of what life is like for you. So just for an example, if you have a young boy that is being sexually abused his brain is now looking for other things to associate with that to help him be aware of when they're in danger of being sexually abused. So they begin to realize every time they're sexually abused, their uncle wears Old Spice cologne. So now every time they smell Old Spice, sexual abuse. There's now a connection in that brain. Now that doesn't mean it's an accurate one. 
But for that child, that's their experience. That's what they've gone through. And so it's accurate for them. Doesn't mean that every man that wears Old Spice is going to sexually abuse them. But in their world, that's the reality of their world. Next one. Let's say a child, every time they cry, they get punished. They get smacked by their dad. So what is going on in their subconscious? It's building a program saying, don't cry because if you cry, you'll get hurt. Crying is bad. Crying is weakness. It is forming beliefs. It is forming an understanding of what to do with crying based on their experience. And so what you can see is that complex trauma is messing up that program. It is causing wrong beliefs about a healthy life because their life is dangerous. Their life is in survival mode. Another one. If dad comes home drunk, bad stuff always happens. Somebody always gets hurt. So drunk always will lead to this, 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 this. So it is doing this creating of patterns. And you can imagine the amount of energy and time in the young years of a child's life that is being put into trying to make sense and put all of this together. So that the child begins to know, if this happens, do this. This is what to expect. This is how you respond. That is your subconscious brain. So the key thing that we've begun to understand is the conscious brain, which is 40 bits of data a second, which is much slower, we're only in our conscious brain 1% to 5% of the day. Most of the time, 95 to 99% of the time, we are operating out of our subconscious brain, out of autopilot, out of all of those programs that have been written from early in life about normal, about what to do, all of that. That is the default setting that we operate out of. And so we automatically do stuff without even thinking, without even being aware we're being triggered, all of a sudden we're responding in certain ways. That is the power of the subconscious brain. And when complex trauma comes in and makes a whole bunch of messed up programs and distortions, you can be acting in unhealthy ways using an unhealthy toolkit and you're not even aware that you've been triggered because your subconscious brain is doing all of that in autopilot. And so part of what we're learning in recovery is two levels of self-awareness. I need to be aware of my triggers. I need to be aware of my responses, my behaviors, my attitudes, my actions. But I hope what you're seeing is there's a deeper layer that we need to gradually become aware of. And that is I need to gradually become aware of the programs in my subconscious brain. Of all the stuff that's down there just running away smoothly without me even being aware of it. But it's programmed faulty. And if I'm going to get healthy, I got to become aware of those programs that are operating in the subconscious bring them to my conscious level and begin to change them. And that takes concentration. That takes a lot of work. But that part of self-awareness is so important. And so self-awareness on both levels is a gradual process. You get greater self-awareness as you learn more information, but as, as you go through life experiences as well. But this beginning to learn all of the maladaptive programs that have come out of complex trauma that set me up to fail in adult life is a huge part of recovery. And so that is what much of what we do is really trying to help people become aware of the maladaptive programs that are in their subconscious brain. Now I want to go beyond that now to the next part. And, and so Dr. Daniel Kahneman is one of the prime researchers on the subconscious brain. And he's written a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. It's an excellent book. It's basically 
all of his 40 some years of research and teaching on the subconscious brain he's distilled to put it all into a book and it's just full of powerful information what i want to begin with that he shows is two key things that the subconscious brain is doing and it's around this whole creating all these programs it's called norms and priming and so norms basically is it's taking every experience that happens to the child and beginning to piece out this is what normal looks like so it's updating and maintaining a model of the personal world of that child that represents this is normal this is what you can expect this is what your life looks like so that model is constructed by associations of hundreds and thousands of different circumstances and events actions and then the consequences of those actions things that happen regularly things that happen infrequently all of that the brain is putting together this model of what is normal in that child's life as these that model is formed then you begin to get links established so that if there's old spice sexual abuse if there's dad drunk this is going to happen. If there's crying, this is going to happen. All of those things are beginning to happen. So you get a norms, but now you get associations within that. So the brain is looking for associations as early warning signs, as things that tell you if this happens, then expect this to happen. So that is going on all the time. But what is important to realize is once that norm is set and all those associations are in place, that now begins to affect how you interpret the present. And it affects your expectations for the future. Because now you have a belief system. Now you have biases. Now you have assumptions based on the norm that you were given. That now affects how you interpret what happens today and what you expect for tomorrow. And so if that norm came out of survival mode and it came out of unhealthy, then all the assumptions, biases, beliefs are skewed and they're going to create faulty interpretations of what's happening today and unrealistic expectations of tomorrow. That's the problem. And so that is what I want you to think about. So another way to look at this norms is to come at it from the perspective, perspective of surprise. So there's two types of surprise. So usually when we think of surprise, it's actually what is known as the passive type of surprise. Something happens to you that you weren't expecting. And so you are surprised. But what I want you to see is that passive type of surprise is rare. Things happen that we weren't expecting. That happens rarely. And so your brain doesn't even see them as normal. That's why it's a surprise. It didn't expect them. But the key thing when it comes to the subconscious brain is to see the active type of surprise. And that is when the brain creates this model of normal, that this is what's going to happen every day. So think of your child gets home from school every day at 3.45 p.m. like clockwork, Monday to Friday. So that's your normal. You just expect your child's going to walk through the door around 3.45. What happens if that doesn't happen? What happens if your child doesn't come home at 345 or 346? Now that's a different kind of surprise. That's something that normally happens that all of a sudden doesn't happen. That's the kind of thing that comes out of complex trauma. But that's part of what the brain, the subconscious brain, is constantly looking for after it creates the normal model of what your life should look like and so it's like this should happen this should happen this is what happens 
And so that's why you can come out in the morning and the house can be dark and you can, you know where the light switch is. You'd be surprised if the light switch wasn't there on that day. You know where the kettle is or the coffee maker is. You'd be surprised if it's not there. Something's wrong. That's the kind of thing is when something that normally is part of your life is now changed and not there, all of a sudden you're concerned. What's going on here? And so what, if you stop and think about it, what you begin to realize is there are thousands of things that are normal in our everyday routine. Where the light switch is, where the bathroom is, what happens when we flip a switch, what happens when we turn the oven on. All of those things, thousands and thousands, are now our normals. If one of those isn't happening, we're surprised. And all of a sudden, we're concerned. Something's not right. So, think of it even further. If what we were expecting didn't happen, our subconscious brain or detects that something's not normal with alarming speed. So let me say that your spouse calls you every day at two o'clock and so you know their voice, you know them intimately, and so they say hi and how are you? They call you today and they say hi, but there's something slightly different in their voice. There's something slightly different in their body language. There's something slightly different in their breathing. Something slightly different in their eye movement. You know something's wrong. It's the slightest of change. They say all the same words. Hi, how are you? But something is slightly off. That's how fine-tuned your subconscious gets this normal model. It knows what to look for in breathing, in eye movement, in body language, in tone of voice, in how shaky the voice is. It's just got thousands and thousands of things that it used to measure its normal. And that was so important for a child to feel safe. And when it didn't feel safe, it began to look for every little possible thing that it could look for to give consistency that would be normal and safe. And so it detects all of that. Take it further with people that I deal with regularly with complex trauma. They've developed the normal of dad coming home in a good mood and dad coming home in a bad mood. And so now, as soon as dad pulls into the driveway, they can tell by the speed of the car, they can tell by slamming the brakes, how the door of the car gets shut, how the door of the house gets open, how dad throws his keys. Every single one of them is now something that alerts them to, is dad normal or not normal? Dad in a good mood or a bad mood? That is the subconscious brain. It's developed all kinds of checklists of how to test if this is within normal and good for me. So that is your subconscious brain. It is constantly evaluating thousands and thousands of clues and things doing that. Now let me take it further. What we know about the subconscious brain is it's inherently lazy. It doesn't like to work really hard as far as concentrating. It just likes observing and making conclusions. So what they've done with the subconscious brain is they've watched a person or they've had somebody watch a person throw a ball in the air and it's the same movement over and over person throws the ball catches it throws the ball catches it and they do it hundreds thousands and thousands of times what's happening to the observer in the subconscious brain is they're seeing a pattern they're saying this is what happens and it happens repeatedly so every time the arm goes up the ball will then go up, lob, come back down, and the person will catch it. The brain then begins to go, okay, that's a pattern I'm familiar with. Now it begins to fill in pieces even though they're not there. So as what they've done, as soon as the person starts to throw the, put their arm up like they're going to throw, the person doesn't have a ball in their hand, but they start the motion. And then they act like they're going to catch it. 
what they found is the person who's watching actually thinks they saw them throw the ball because the subconscious brain filled in the pieces. And that's what begins to happen. And so once it detects a pattern and thinks it has a normal, now it just jumps to conclusions. Now it fills in stuff that isn't necessarily even true. It's looking for shortcuts to make its life easier. So that's another piece. Now let me just take it further, a little different direction. Think of this in terms of just, again, how fine-tuned the subconscious brain becomes. Just if you're, you're from Canada, we would have a whole bunch of different words for rain. So we could say it's misting, it's spitting, drizzle, gentle rain, torrents, cats and dogs, teeming rain. If you're in Canada, you understand the slight nuanced difference of each one of those words. It's not referring to the same thing. It's referring to slightly different. But we have the range of what drizzle means in our subconscious. We have the range of what spitting means in our subconscious. So it it's got a range of normal for that word, a range of normal for that word. So take size, for example. The subconscious brain has looked at many, many elephants as the child grew up. It now, as soon as it hears the words element, elephant, it knows this kind of size. It's looked at pictures of many, many mice, seen mice. So as soon as it sees a mouse, or here's the word mouse, it automatically thinks this size. It's got a range of size. When it hears the word giraffe, it's got a range of size. Every word, the subconscious brain has got a definition, but it's got a range of what's within that definition. All stored within the subconscious brain. That's its normal. That's its defining life, making sense of life, knowing what to expect. But then, let's go a wee bit further. The subconscious brain can then start jumping to conclusions when it comes to causes. So we got the child, every time there's Old Spice cologne, sexual abuse. So now, Old Spice, they smell it. They jump to the conclusion of must be sexual abuse going to happen. Now it's faulty. So what was true in their unsafe world isn't necessarily true in a safe world, but their brain jumps to worst case scenario to try to keep it safe. Let me give you another example. Here's a simple statement. Fred was angry. His parents were late and the caterers would be arriving soon. Now your brain goes, why is Fred angry? And it automatically usually jumps to the conclusion that the parents are late and punctuality is important to Fred. We just jump to that conclusion. That might not be why Fred is angry. But what I want you to see is the subconscious brain is constantly working to provide interpretations to everything that happens. And what does it have to go on? Past models of normal past understandings of life. They might not be accurate, but it's going to fill in the blanks because it needs to somehow explain what is happening and all it's got is the existing model to go from. So that can be a problem. So that's norms. Now, the next piece to that is what is known as priming. And so basically what that means is you can set off a whole bunch of different thoughts and associations in that model of normal by introducing a stimulus. So Old Spice, that sets off a whole bunch of memories, that sets off a whole bunch of expectations, a bunch of beliefs. It stimulates a domino effect within the brain that connects a whole bunch of experiences, a whole bunch of ideas a whole bunch of thinking. So that is called priming. When you introduce some event, some sensation, some stimuli, without us even realizing it, it could be setting off a whole bunch of connections within the subconscious. 
And all of a sudden, we are doing certain things, thinking certain things, reacting a certain way, because a certain stimulus triggered a whole bunch of things. So that is what is known as priming. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you were exposed to food, to eating over and over again in conversation throughout a day on purpose. Or you were exposed to washing, to cleaning, laundry, all kinds of different things. Okay? Then we showed you this picture. So if you've been exposed to eating stuff and you saw SO-P, so it could be soap or soup, what would your brain assume? It would assume soup. If you had been exposed to washing, to detergent laundry, all of that, what would your brain fill in? When it saw towel, shower, shampoo, it would go soap. So the priming was, we talked about a topic, and now when you see a certain word, you fill in one of the letters, because now it's going to, it connects to what you've been exposed to, what you've been thinking about. You've been primed to interpret that event, that word, a certain way because your brain started making connections. So that is priming. So again, what is happening today, the subconscious brain is going back through every memory it has of that thing and it is pulling together all of those memories together so you hear the word dog, your brain somehow brings up cat. Then it goes to being bitten. Then it goes to being afraid. Then it goes to cuddling with a dog. Then it goes to a, your best friend. Then it goes to, it is connecting what you've experienced and learned over your whole life. So priming is used all the time today in advertising, in all kinds of different manipulation things to influence people. So they will talk about stuff, use a certain word, use a certain picture, knowing that there's a good chance it's going to set off a whole bunch of connections in the subconscious brain and you'll end up doing a certain behavior. So let me give you a study that was done by Dr. John Barge with students at New York University. Quite interesting. Um, so what they did was they gave people five random words. So you can pick any five words, car, spaghetti, socks, shirt, toboggan. And then they were asked to make four sentences from those words, okay? One of the groups of students was given words where half of the words were related to elderly people. And so they made four sentences with those words. Then they were asked to go down the hall to a different room. Now they thought they were just going to the next part of the test. What they didn't realize is how they behaved walking down the hall to the next room was really what the test was about. And what they found was the students who had been given words that had to do with the elderly they walk slower than the other students. They didn't even realize they were walking slower, slower. They didn't even realize that the words about the elderly had affected them and changed how they walk. They were totally unaware of it. But that's what happened. So they were thinking about elderly, hearing about elderly, putting sentences together about elderly. They thought they were just doing an exercise. They thought it was innocent. But it affected their behavior. That's priming. That's the power of the subconscious brain. So I hope this just helps you begin to go, wow, when that subconscious brain gets programmed improperly, the norms are all out of whack, and the biases and beliefs are not accurate, and then that gets primed by something, that triggers a person to respond and think in ways that could do them a lot of harm and could do a lot, others a lot of harm. It is super challenging. So let me just summarize what we've learned about the subconscious brain. It automa operates automatically and quickly with little or no effort and without a sense of voluntary control. So it's just happening below the surface. 
It generates impressions, feelings, and inclinations. And once those are endorsed, so they arise to the conscious brain level, the conscious brain endorses them, they become beliefs, attitudes, and intentions. Okay? Next one, the, the subconscious brain creates a coherent pattern out of all the ideas and activities which becomes your normal. It links a sense of cognitive case to illusions of trust and pleasant feelings. So it's very much got a lot of emotional pieces to it that influences it. It distinguishes the surprising from the normal. It infers and invents causes and intentions. It neglects ambiguity and suppresses doubt. So it doesn't want doubt. It wants everything to be solid dogmatic because it doesn't like ambiguity. It wants a model that's reliable constantly. So it will create black and white in order to try to prevent ambiguity. But yet it's gullible, it's lazy, and it's biased to believe certain things and confirm certain things. It focuses on what it can see, but it ignores what it can't see. And that increases the bias. So that's the subconscious brain. Next time we're going to look at a lot of the biases that come out of the subconscious brain and that many with complex trauma have to begin to deal with and become aware of and the damage they can do. But to end today, I want to just talk about how do we heal the subconscious brain if it's been programmed properly? That takes a lot of time. So let me, again, give an example I've used before, and it's of riding a bicycle. So when you learn to ride a bicycle, you have to concentrate. That's your conscious brain. You've got to concentrate on balance, on steering, and that takes a lot of effort. But as you practice and do it, it becomes easier and easier. But what is happening is the programs for maintaining balance, for steering, those are going to the subconscious. And it can now begin to do those on its own. And so now you can ride a bike and talk to somebody, be on the phone, listen to a book. Why? Because your subconscious brain is now taking care of riding the bike, which frees your conscious brain up to talk to somebody, to listen to a book. So a skill goes from needing the conscious brain to learn it, but then it goes to a subconscious program that can do it by itself. And that's what's happened with complex trauma. It's created thousands of programs that are not necessarily healthy. So how do you change that? So take example. You create a bike where everything is opposite. So now when you want to turn right, you got to turn the bike left. And I've watched a video where they've actually done this. And er people get on and go, okay, I think I can do this. And they get on and every single person immediately falls over. Why? Because their subconscious brain immediately goes to, to balance, to steer. Here's what you got to do. And it does it and it's the opposite and you fall over. And so after repeated attempts, they eventually, conscious with great concentration, are able to steer the opposite way, to keep their balance. But that takes tremendous concentration. After a while, they're starting to be able to steer this, ride this reverse bicycle. But let's say they're starting to do that. It's getting to now to a new set of programs in their subconscious brain. But then somebody comes along on the sidewalk and says, hi, how are you today? And their attention at a conscious level is now given to talk to that person. What happens? Their subconscious old program takes over and they go back to riding a bike the old way and they fall over. It takes six months to a year before that subconscious new program overpowers the old subconscious program for riding a bike. And that's just riding a bike. When you think of the thousands of different programs that are down there that were trained one way and you realize it's unhealthy, and now you got to train it another way, that's a lot of work. you got to bring each one to the conscious level, concentrate 
with great intensity in order to be able to bring change to that. That's why we talk about healing from complex trauma it can take two to 10 years. And that's because of these subconscious programs that need to be changed. That's the amount of work. That's the amount of time. This is not a simple, quick process. This is a slow, messy process that requires lots of patience and lots of self-compassion. Next time we're going to dig into another aspect of this subconscious brain and all of the biases and assumptions and beliefs that it makes and how complex trauma can make those very faulty and, and how there's a ton of work and, and beginning to bring change at that level as well. But I hope today has been helpful for you just to realize the amazing power of our subconscious brain and how it affects everything we do even when we're not aware of it. Well, that's the end of our Friday night. I hope it was helpful. Have a great weekend.